Hello, everybody. This is Pete Morris on the Comanche Zoom, and we are doing the uh, second half of, or second part of the propeller design. Here it is uh, on your screen now, Propeller Design, Performance, and Care, part number two with Daryl Poole. Uh, he's going to spend some time uh, answering some of the questions that were placed in the chat window from last uh, the last meeting we had a week ago and carry on with the rest of the story about how to care for your propeller and uh, what, how to help choose the proper propeller for what you want to fly with. So with that, I will stop the share and we'll go back to the regular old gallery view and people are allowed to remute or uh, re unmute themselves and go over the old chat, who you are, where you are and what you fly. I'm Ray Fay from Madison, Wisconsin, and I fly a 260B model, and uh, I love it, like we all do. I'm Pete Morris. I'm from Connecticut. Uh, my two Comanches, my old Comanche, is still sitting down there on the web, on the ramp, covered with snow, and my newer one, to me, is uh, ready to go if I wanted to fly later tomorrow. Go ahead, anybody, key the mic and tell who you are, where you are. In Southeast Pennsylvania, last week I had a gear up. Oh. I finally found out that the uh, landing oh, conduit had, uh, it, I still had the original, I hadn't gotten the newer ones, and it had bound up inside the conduit and froze, completely froze that, that uh, system. That's very similar what to something that happened it? in my community, my first Comanche. The push-pull conduit that goes through the sleeve, it bound up, so it was like those Chinese finger things where you're stuck, it it wouldn't move either way. Yep. Spent an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes in the air trying to move the gear one way or another, and she wouldn't go, so I did a gear up. I think no, I, was told, I was told a long time ago by an a &P that those should not be greased. That should be sanded clean, wiped clean, and kept dry. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, and I don't know if mine were greased or not. We're still investigating. But uh, what I was always told is if you uh, put your hand on the emergency gear extension and count how long it takes to move the gear, that that's a first symbol, first sign that maybe you're getting some binding. But I never, now I don't believe that because there was always seven seconds for me to have the gear move and it, it did it up till the day it froze halfway. Seven seconds up and down? Uh, one direction, either direction was always seven seconds. Oh, I think that's how fast the gear more turned if yeah. it was free to. My Comanche was, uh, when I had to collapse, the, uh, the two tubes, the telescoping tubes, the one that's supposed to go out when you're lowering the gear stayed in. So the cable went out, but not the tube. So uh, my unlatched, it didn't, it didn't quite lock with only the cable pushing it out. And that, that seven seconds is a book value too, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that, but I've always yeah. heard that, but that didn't help me. I should have. And, and, and I've always, and people I've talked to out here are, are on, the, on the, the cable maintenance, you know, that is uh, just clean them up. But yeah, you don't want to, uh, you know, grease them up for some reason, probably because grease attracts dust and dirt after a while. Exactly. The grease Wait pulls the dirt. It's work for me for propellers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, on your on your gear up, I, 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 I assume you weren't injured or anything, right? No, no. It was a kind of classic. I had a long time to work it out. My wife was with me. Oh, and uh, <laughs> if I had anything to do over again, I probably wouldn't have gone full flaps. I would have gone half flaps. But even so, the flaps only had about two inches by two inches, maybe an inch and a half by an inch and a half damage right by the fuselage. And because the gear was uh, not completely, when it collapsed, it didn't completely go back in. Oh, it protected good. quite a bit of the underbelly. Like the gear doors are fine, which really shocked me. All three of them are fine. <laughs> They're certainly very bottom plane skinned up and uh, exhaust tube. And uh, I, I, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I was just wondering what the insurance. Yes. 
policy would cover on something like that. It clearly wasn't your fault. It was just a you know act of Buddha. Still, I'm know. still figuring that all out. Um, and we're in the middle of all that. And I'm sure hoping that we rebuild it. It looks like we will. Okay. It's still a little early on. The FAA, though, has been a major. They wanted all the log books back to 66. They're just I, going through everything with fine tooth comb and microscope. There's nothing to find, but they're still finding it. That's what they do. <laughs> I'm Alan Larson, Capron, Illinois, and I have a 260C. And the first annual I did, and uh, when I after buying the airplane in 2016, uh, we did the uh, retraction chest, and because of the high amperage uh, draw on it, we replaced both the conduits from uh, Webco. Did you you got the Teflon line ones? Alan, did you get the Teflon line uh, t conduits? Because I know Webco, that's what they used to sell, and they have not been able to get a new shipment of them in quite a while. Yeah, they had uh, the Teflon at the time back in 2016. Yep. Yeah, that's, I, mine was that way also I, when I replaced the ones in mine. And in my case, the uh, insurance did pay for it because it was a mechanical failure. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't. This was just an annual with a uh, retraction test. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, in answer to uh, uh, Kelly's uh, question about the whether the insurance might pay. Hey, okay, key the mic. Hi, everybody. Where are you? Where are you? What do you fly? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Pat Lee, and I fly a 260. I'm out here in Minnesota. And then um, as you guys were talking about the, the lines for the retracts, where do you, now what I did on the last annual is we cleaned it, we put graphite on it, right where the, the gear, emergency gear handle is and then down below. My, uh, that IA, right or not? my IA said that the best thing that he's ever found for the conduits, no matter what is mouse milk and uh, what a difference. And mine are in pretty good shape. After I bought my 260B, uh, the uh, extension time was 26 seconds, and the retraction time was uh, about 22. And eight, 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 eight down and eight up is the maximum. And uh, I rebuilt the transmission and went through the whole thing. It's perfection. So were you guys saying where the best place to put mouse milk is? Uh, mouse milk. And then you just kind of put it right where the emergency gear is and then let it soak its way down? Yeah, uh, blow a little air into it so it can get and, and make some of the rest of the stuff ooze out. Uh, you're never gonna get it all out uh, or, I mean, Nobody's got that kind of time to disassemble it and then pull it all apart and maybe get it back together right. I do not know. I couldn't find in my logbooks whether they've never been replaced. My my 260B has only got uh, 3,900 total time on it. I doubt whether anybody did that. It's got a factory reman engine in it, but uh, uh, I don't know. But I looked all through the logs, and the logs are really good. So... I don't know whether they're original or whether they were replaced and nobody wrote it down. Whoever knows, right? Yeah, my client had 7,000 hours and they were still original. My plane also was kept in a hangar all of its life. Okay, key the mic. Who are you? Where are you? What's your fly? Yeah, hello. Hey, Bill. Uh, Bill Casey. I'm in um, coastal central California, a little town called King City. I've got a PA39 uh, turbo. 
and my wife and I, we take it coast to coast and border to border and do a lot of traveling, fly about uh, somewhere between 120 to 150 hours a year in it the past few years. So it's great to get a great airplane. We love it and get a lot of use out of it. That's terrific. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Hey folks, Tom Boyko in Burbank, California, joining you. It's a Comanche 260B, but it's kind of in the process of transferring owners right now. Another new member to Comanche Society, uh, Greg uh, Sanders, over there in Bristol, Virginia, is going to be the new owner pretty soon. He might be on right now, I don't know, but anyways... Uh, it's been a good run. I've had that airplane 39 years. Great wow. airplane. I didn't hear the discussion earlier about the part or something that someone was consider uh, was talking about whether it was replaced or not. What is the part you're talking about? Uh, the gear transmission. Yeah, the gear conduits. No, the transmission. Uh, I sent it, took it out and sent it to Webco and it came back in beautiful condition and then I put it back in and did all the uh, alignments like the book says and everything and it works like a champ. <clears throat> Chances are that the, uh, it depends on how somebody operated that. You know, when the gear is retracting and it's about halfway up, it's good to get a hold of the handle, the Johnson bar, whatever you want to call it, and push on it. And that takes the main load off of that transmission and that transmission will last forever. So if somebody was doing that, that's good. It runs on a set of ball bearings in there and ours was replaced at about uh, 3000 hours, I think. Um, Webco had rebuilt it. So that's the only way to go. Right. But you can tell if that thing is getting bad if it growls. You know, it's just like a wheel bearing in there and it'll start growling. And when you hear that, you'll notice that the amps will go up also just about the time it is fully retracted. So look out for noises in it. If it's not making any noise, don't worry about it. Just keep it greased. <laughs> well, this is uh, CJ. I'm just gonna pop in to say that I have very good news for everybody concerned about landing gear uh, maintenance, which is that Hans Newbert, who I believe I just heard speaking, and Matt Kirk are in the process of scheduling their Comanche Zoom on uh, landing gear maintenance gotchas. And Matt Kirk is ComancheGear.com. And Hans, of course, uh, is a, an efficiency expert in the twins in particular and a DER, but he also created the thousand hour landing gear AD DVD. And so it should be amazing to hear from you guys and help you keep us from, you know, gear collapses and gear ups. Thank you for. My 260B is up on jacks now and I'm going through uh, Hans's uh, CD and I'm doing the thousand hour. Oh, brilliant, Rich. <laughs> How is it? Uh, so far it looks really pretty clean. Uh, before I even started, I shook I uh, shook the hell out of it, and nothing seemed to move wrong. Uh, and so the plane has never been down. Uh, it's never been banged along a runway. It's never been anything, and it's always been hangered, uh, and it's been kept very, very clean. And when I greased the gear, I looked like some kind of a monkey with a hand grease gun, and I get every single zerk. I take them apart, <laughs> clean them, shoot them. I mean, it's like I did with my race cars and every other thing that I've ever had grease it, clean it, and uh, don't leave any extra on it to collect dirt. And uh, the people that had it before me and uh, the, the IA is a personal friend of mine on that. That's how I got the plane. But boy, I'll tell you what, uh, they took really, really, really good care of it. And uh, I got lucky. And uh, I'm doing the same thing they did. Good deal. They're about keeping it greased. Um, that those bushings barely wear if you keep them greased. That's even right. The new ones, even the new ones have a little play in them. 
So don't be excited if you put new bushings in and you feel a little bit of uh, play in there. Yeah. Hans well, back to has who we are. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Hans Newbert, uh, as a source for those bushings, did he tell you where to get them? Yeah, it's somewhere, Webco. It's somewhere in his uh, CD. And I think you're right. I think it's Webco. Yeah. Okay. So, well, heck. Um, so, <clears throat> CJ from Vermont flying a 260B and a 180. And if you got a quiet moment, jump in and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. And welcome. Hi there. This is Donnie. I fly a 250, and I'm based in Mansfield, Massachusetts. Great to have you, Donnie. Good to see you here. Yeah, it's been a little bit busy. Yeah, <laughs> you have one of those jobs. Oh yeah, we just opened. Welcome back. Place. Yeah, the Fenway's open. Yeah, it's open for uh, the vaccine. Good deal. Thanks for serving the community. <laughs> Keep busy and welcome. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll hop in any quiet moment. Say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hey. Hi, uh, Let's see. Hi, CJ. This is Gary. Uh, I have a uh, 250, 64, but it's fuel injected. And I've never come across anybody else with a 250 fuel injected. And last week they were talking about Piper Service 861, where you're basically running alternate air past the injector system in case of ice. So I'm interested. Has anybody else got a 250 fuel injected? And if you've got a fuel injected 250, now is the perfect chance to jump in and say who you are, where you are, and that you're flying an injected 250. Um, Gary, I did just run across another fuel injected 250 on the Piper Comanche Facebook group, and I'll try to track them down and get you in touch. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, um, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. After you, Bill. Oh, yeah, this is Bill Brown. Um, I'm in Northville, Michigan, and I'm flying a PA-30, and it's a 63, um, one zero Yankee, so it might be the oldest one flying. I'm not sure. My dad and I have owned it since 1969. Welcome, Bill, and that's a cool story. What did you say your current age was? I'm 64. My dad's still alive, and he's 99. And flying? Uh, riding, not flying, but uh, he could still fly. Never lost that his That is medical. cool. Oh. I'm impressed. Well, welcome and thanks for joining us. You're welcome. welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam. I have a 400 project in Colorado, um, but I currently live in the UK and about to start borrowing and flying a friend's PA-30. Welcome, Adam, and congratulations. Hello everyone, uh, Bernie Poland from uh, Detroit area, and I'm flying a PA-39, 1970 normal, um, and right now flying it back and forth to Southwest Florida. That is the ideal mission for that airplane. Gary, welcome and good to see you. Sorry, Bernie. It's okay. And today is a red letter day. I got the check for selling my last business. Hank, congratulations and welcome back to the land of sanity. <laughs> I am now retired. I think your volume is way too low. Yeah, Bernie's right, Hank. You are a little bit. Okay, I'll try to get closer to the mic. That's better. And Tim, we just saw your text. Welcome, Tim H. from Canada, Alberta. And you had some really great input into the last propellers on Canadian propeller regulations. So welcome and keep chatting. Okay, I think at this point, I'm gonna do my, uh, my little uh, sales pitch deal for stuff. And you can keep on sharing as long as you take a look. Go ahead with it, Mike, no problem. Just, you know, here's just something to look at on the screen. Don Pitts, Lovington, New Mexico. I have a, a 1966 260B. Welcome back, Don, good to see you. 
been a great year. And this is Rob Whiteley um, for you guys that haven't been just joined recently. Uh, I'm uh, I'm located in Concord and I have a 1967 um, PA30 turbo and uh, I've had it for about a year and a half now. I really like it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Rob, you got a great bird. Welcome. You said that was Concord, California near Sacramento? Yes, ma'am. Welcome to the group. All right. Okay, Tara, Lindsay, the 1966 Comanche 260 Big, Whiteman, California. Welcome to Terry and thanks for being here. And Serge St. Hilaire, welcome and welcome to new Comanche ownership and another Canadian heard from. John Fodder, Greenfield, Mass, 9317 Pop, 260C. Mr. Futter, welcome and good to see you again. It's up for pleasure as always. <laughs> pleasure is ours. A little sales pitch here. Take a look at this uh, Comanche swap thing. Those of you are getting the, the thing from Les, there's a whole list there you can see. There's getting to be quite a few things in that list. And if you have something you want to send in, send it to Les. And that is to les.thomas at gmail.com or uh, Pete, you've got a form people can fill out to get a listing done, right? Right, there is a form on the website. Uh, if you go to the forms page on the website, it's on there. And uh, so everybody, if you've got something you want or something you think somebody else might want, you can send it in and it's a buy sell trade listing and it's free. We also have had some questions about how to give money. And here's a way of doing it right here. Send a check to the address for the Northeast Comanche tribe right here and make it out to Northeast Comanche tribe incorporated. And actually, as long as we're on that topic, Les, you have created a donate button uh, to PayPal if you want to keep these zooms going. Um, if you could post the link into the chat, if there is one, that would be great. And back to who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Oh, Bill Ruckin, Silverdale, Washington, a Comanche 250. That is a beautiful Comanche 250 and a great setting. Bill, welcome and thanks for joining us. That's uh, Moose Creek, Idaho. So. <laughs> that looks like a destination. We need to set a fly in for it. Absolutely. <laughs> if you contact us and you're interested, we'll help you do that. I was actually going to try to write an article for the magazine I've been going back there in the Comanche for 25 years and other airplanes before that but um, and my uncles went back there in the Comanches in the 50s so I thought I'd do an article for the Comanche magazine sometime. Fantastic that is going to be a great one. So, this is Ray Fay and uh, that looks a lot like uh, another place in Idaho Johnson Creek yeah, I go to Johnson Creek, but we call that glamping because you <laughs> they have showers and the guy cuts your firewood for you. That's really kind of cheating. But. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful spot though. Absolutely it is. What's the speaking field of elevation? glamping? Oh go ahead. What's the field elevation there? Moose Creek. Well, Moose Creek is about 26, 20. 400. Johnson is upwards of 4,000 something. Yeah, I remember camping there when, uh, but I think I drove up. We had a, a fly in out of Boise, but drove in. Yeah. The, yeah, Johnson, you can't, yeah, of course, Moose, you can't get there, but you'd have to hike almost 30 miles to get there. So, yeah, it's out in the wilderness. 
Yeah, I don't remember anything about uh, other than being there and uh, enjoying the flying. Yeah. I had a family at that time. There's probably 30 or more strips we go and the other yep. ones with 185, but um, I'll take the Comanche into about four or five of them. It's plenty good. So yeah, we used to we used to fly into uh, the uh, the uh, what is this? Uh, the, is it the Snake River uh, in in uh, uh, Boise Sheriff's Office uh, Beaver? Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. And anybody else? Just uh, we have a couple of minutes left for people to jump in, say who you are, where you are. And Dale Fisher from Indiana. I think you said Indiana. Welcome, and thanks for posting into the chat. And anybody else want to jump in over the next five minutes and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly? And welcome to the Comanche Zoom on propellers too. This is, this is Margie Leggett, and uh, I'm out of the Tri Cities in Washington, and I fly a Piper. Our uh, Comanche 250, 1964. Margie Leggett, welcome and thank you. I uh, just want to give Mar Margie a shout out for helping to get uh, wings credit for some of our Comanche Zooms. And so just uh, thank you for working on that, Margie. We just greatly appreciate it. Jim Brown. Jim Brown, welcome. Thanks. 260, Calgary. Awesome. We love Canada. <laughs> you guys have got quite the prop thing going on up there, though. Pretty big distinction. Yeah. Hi, True. I'm Bill Kniff, based in North Carolina, New Bern, right next to Cherry Point. I, I used to fly a 260C. I still own it, but I haven't seen it in a long time. One of these days, we, we, it would be pleasant to, to get the airplane back. Oh, Florence didn't treat it too well. Bill Kniff, welcome. I just want to quickly recognize Bill as one of our longest uh, standing Comanche owners, um, one of the earliest members of the Comanche Society, and one of the people that helped run incredibly transparent paper ballot elections to keep uh, all of us together and running. So Bill, thank you and welcome. My pleasure. You're keeping us on mission and we appreciate it. Uh, good evening, uh, this is Robert Klein. I'm in the Charlottesville area and I'm one of the, I'm the guy behind the Zoom that coordinates the FAA wings credit there is somebody out there with the name of iPad. I can't approve you. I can't find out who you are. So if you're iPad or iPhone, I can't track you. You can rename yourself anything you want. It could be strawberry. As long as <laughs> that strawberry belongs to a certain email address, then I can get you wings credit. Uh, you can text me uh, privately and I can rename it for you. If you can't do it yourself, uh, at the, if you have, see three little dots and click over those, one of them will be to rename. I'm just one of the guys in the background helping the things go on. Thank you. And Robert Klein, welcome, welcome and welcome your 180. Um, Robert, by the way, one of his early things on getting his 180 was to fly it from Virginia uh, pretty much all the way to Los Angeles Center and back. <laughs> and so um, thank you for the work you do behind the scenes, Robert, to keep all this working. Uh, sure thing, sure thing. Las Vegas, not Los Angeles. No, but you were talking to LA Center uh, when you landed. No, yeah, I sure was. <laughs> this uh, the Zoom tonight is at this point is not a wings credit thing, but as, as Robert said, if you do ever want to get wings credit, we got to know who you are by name, not just by iPad. Yep, and we. We will, um, I am gonna, Margie, I owe you a call. Forgive me for, for putting the public business right into the chat here, but um, Margie Leggett is one of the five FAST team representatives who often attend and that's a requirement to get WINGS credit. And part of the early chat was that this topic is such a vital safety area that we probably shouldn't have made the effort to seek it. Um, a lot of stuff is happening really fast. And so we're often a little behind the eight ball. 
but uh, Margie, I'll be in touch about the wings presentation, but also potentially about credit, Margie and George. Uh, I guess it's 7.30, so Pete, you wanna? You can do it, go for it. All right, well, in that case, I'm gonna introduce Daryl Poole, um, Daryl for Propellers 2. So this is a follow-on to last week, which is Propellers 1. And uh, Daryl ran a prop shop for decades and is probably best known as the distributor for electronic ignition electro air, but is passionate about general aviation and safety and maintenance and has a wealth of, uh, of knowledge. So Daryl, welcome. And thanks for, uh, for being our knowledge source for propellers too. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me back. I would suggest I that everybody, so. before Dale gets started, I suggest that everybody goes to the speaker view so that you'll have just one face in your face. And then uh, I'm gonna ask everybody else to, to mute so Daryl can go uninterrupted. Un yeah, and just a quick note that uh, Propellers won, people discovered prop balancing and we did an enormous deep dive into prop balancing with a few questions remaining, a uh, lots of interest in like how it actually works. And then um, topics like, you know, how to select the perfect propeller for your mission and uh, care and feeding and how to know when things are going wrong before it happens uh, got moved to today. So um, just a sort of level set for those that weren't here are for propellers one. Welcome everybody and Daryl, thanks again. I missed what you said CJ. Oh, just that uh, uh, thanks for being here and thanks again for coming back for Propellers. Too. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate you guys having me back. I apologize if I'm not uh, super chippy. It's been a long day. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to start I, with... I had, uh, to spend some with... I had to spend some time in the MRI tube today. That, that wasn't fun. Yeah. How do you want to start this, CJ? You want and to start I, going through some of the some of the questions that were asked last time? Sounds good. Do you want to start with? Uh, we had a bunch of people that were still uh, sort of deep diving into the prop balancing, and some of the questions that came up had to do with um, exactly, or obviously, it varies a little bit depending on which prop balancer, but how like how prop balancing actually works. Like, what do you do? What's the process? And then a little bit about what's the, a little bit about what's the technical uh, stuff behind the scenes. Um, sure. Um, prop balancing has been around actually for, for quite a while. Um, basically the, the science behind it, uh, you have what is called a velocimeter or an accelerometer. They're both the, the same thing. They just use two different terms. This unit is mounted to the uh, typically um, just behind the propeller. Uh, a lot of times they'll use the front uh, case bolt and the velocimeter will be mounted in a uh, perpendicular position so that it's actually aiming down through the crankshaft. Uh, we need it up by the prop because the prop is what we're focusing on. What the accelerometer is doing, what's actually inside of this little tubing unit or like a, a fine glass bead is what's inside this unit. And it's packed really, really, really tightly, but it's also, the more it moves, the more of a, a static charge it will emit. And it's that static charge is what the computer is seeing. And, and what we're doing with the velocimeter is we're, we're actually measuring the magnitude of vibration that is being produced by the engine propeller combination. The other thing that it's looking at is, is phase because it, it, it is creating the, the actual vibration wave, so to speak, for the computer to see. And the computer takes that information and analyzes the, the wave of the, the vibration to determine its phase. And it uses that information to figure out where the imbalance is. Uh, this is this is all done magically inside the the uh, balance box, and the, the latest generation equipment is very accurate as far as being able to tell the technician who are performing the, the work exactly where to, to locate the weight. Um, it also uses a, a, a photo cell, 
um, the, the current systems use a photo cell. You'll have that mounted somewhere typically on the cowling. You'll have a blade that has a reflective tape on it on the back side of the blade. And it, it, that is, is showing uh, the computer RPM so that it knows how fast it's spinning, but it also tells the computer where the propeller is. So it, it's got basically three points of data that, that it's using to analyze first where the uh, how much the imbalance is, the magnitude, where it is, what the phase is, and then using the, the photo cell to tell us where to mount corrective weights. Now, one thing I did want to mention that I want everybody to keep in mind that we didn't really get into last week Doing a propeller balance, all you're, all you're capable of doing is correcting mass and weight. You can't do anything about what's called an aerodynamic imbalance. Aerodynamic imbalance has come into play when you have blade angle problems. In other words, the blades are not, the relative blade angles from blade to blade are not within a tight enough tolerance, and that's creating a vibration or you could have a blade that is bent out of track, that will create an aerodynamic imbalance. I have also had occasion where I've dealt with a blade out of a blade set that was flexing more than the other blades, causing an out of track condition. Uh, when you say that, people always ask the question, well, how could one blade be flexing more than the others? The most common reason will be that one blade is thinner throughout the length of the blade than the other two. Being thinner allows it to flex more. Of course, the other question is, well, how could they possibly be, be balanced mass-wise? It's possible, believe me, I've, I've seen it. It's typically, that blade's typically gonna be wider than the other, other one or the other two blades, uh, but it's gonna be thinner. And that's where, that's where you can run into some, some real anomalies. And those are the types of things that the propeller shops, when they uh, overhaul these propellers, that's the types of things that they're looking at when they're uh, mating a set of blades because part of the overhaul process you're actually removing material from these blades getting rid of surface damage corrosion nicks scratches that kind of thing the last steps that you go through with, with a blade set in the shop or even at the at the manufacturer is you're looking at the parameters dimensionally from blade to blade so that you don't have any wide variances between the widths and thicknesses of the blades because when you get into, in the, into those type of variances, that's when you can, can develop a, an aerodynamic imbalance. Like I said, aerodynamic imbalances cannot be corrected with a dynamic balance. However, with that said, when, when performing a dynamic balance, if, if your technician finds that he cannot get the prop down to an acceptable level, chances are that prop's gonna need to come off, go into a, a propeller shop and a little more investigation to figure out why we've got this aerodynamic imbalance. It, it's somewhat rare these days uh, just because propeller shops uh, are doing a much better job of, of mating blade sets. A lot of shops, like shop, we bought a pretty expensive piece of equipment that did all the uh, blade measuring for us using uh, laser technology so that we could be super accurate with our blade dimensional checks but these, the programs were set up where they were actually analyzing blade to blade these dimensions for us and would red flag if we had any problems. But in a nutshell, that's how the, the whole balancing system works. Uh, there's different types of equipment out there. Some of the older stuff that you'll see, they're still using strobe lights where the operator actually stands out in front of the airplane. And once he locks on, once the, the computer locks on to the propeller, He'll shine the strobe light at, at the prop. These are one of the blades, and that's where you're going to get your clocking angle or your your phase angle to figure out where you need to mount your your uh, corrective weights. Um, one of the things I recently read in, a, in some little article talked about uh, for the guys that are that are doing the balance balancing, uh, they made the statement that they should remove all the previous balance weights from any other balances. I, I disagree with that, just so y'all know. I, my, my contention has always been, once I do a cursory look over the propeller, make sure I don't see anything I don't like, I would do my first run with all the weights that were previously there, see where we're at, 
because a lot of times it could be as simple as removing some weights that were previously installed and you're done. So I, I kind of disagree with, with that statement of removing all the pre weights. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Does anybody else have any more questions on dynamic balancing? It's done, why it's done, how often you should do it? Uh, I missed the first part of it. I had to take Hello. a call, but the gist of it, and uh, kind of along what you were saying, I just uh, had a had a vibration gremlin for going on a year, and it would come and go. <clears throat> and I've checked everything: the induction, the, you know, all the stuff, normal things you would check. And I finally boiled down to, well, it's got to be the prop. And some days it would fly great. Sometimes it would just, you know try to convince myself it wasn't vibrating, but there was a shake going on. And it was amazing, the guy that did the dynamic balance, he hooked up the machine, ran it up, pulled the graph up, and started pointing out things that have it had nothing to do with the prop balance. I mean, this frequency does this, and this is probably the, the you know, and ultimately, uh, he said, well, you've got another issue going on. I'm not even going to waste my time balancing your prop. There's something going on. He says, I would suggest checking your, uh, what was it? Measure all your rocker arm travels. He says, I suspect one or two are going to be not like the rest. And sure enough, so as a result of just going up and having the prop, at least trying to get it dynamically balanced, he pointed out a problem with my cam was worn out. So that was, now I'm looking at an engine. But, uh, you know, it's better to catch it there, obviously, than, you know, when it gets worse. But uh, it just amazed me all the things he could extrapolate from all the little graphs. Um, it was just incredible. It is. And, and, and you bring up a really good point, equipment there. Some of these cheap don't have that capability all, as far as looking at all these other frequencies they don't have that capability so that, that's one thing that you probably need to ask um, your your tech who's going to do your balance job is just how much capability his equipment has and not only that is how much experience does he have understanding what the machine's telling him <clears throat> so, like the guy you dealt with was pretty pretty sharp that's that's great uh, he, yeah he's a he, he talked in numbers that was way beyond me. It was all Greek, but at the end of it, I realized, yeah, there was. <laughs> it, 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 it is. Yeah. You actually bring up a great point. Uh, even in, in my own experience over the years, I found more than one engine out there that was bad. Uh, found one in particular on a Baron that when they tore it down, uh, it was imminent for failure. Had they had, had I not told the owner that they, he's got a serious engine problem, don't tell him what would have happened. But it was, it was imminent failure was was on the way, and I could I could see it in my in my graphs. I, I could tell that there was something, there was an anomaly that I wasn't used to seeing, uh, and actually made a phone call to uh, an engineer that I, I called on quite often and told him what I was seeing. He said that's a that that more than likely is a crankshaft counterweight issue. That's a bad bad thing. Anybody else got anything they want to add? Uh, we've got a bunch of questions, Daryl. This is CJ coming in from the chat. So I'm going to jump in just because people have been courteous enough to use it. Just a quick heads up, Daryl, your, um, your, it may be your internet connection or it could be a Zoom problem. You're going intermittently choppy um, and doing strange things with volume. So we're going to watch this and then possibly do a reconnection. Right now, you seem to be okay, but I'm asking people just to private message me so that we can monitor whether it's our end, your end, or everybody's end. Um, some of the questions, how do I know if I need to have my prop dynamically balanced? John Perry asked it, and it's a question that I've seen from a couple of different people. How do we know if we need to have it done? Could be a change, we just had an engine top overhauled or we're seeing something strange, how do we know? Um, the, the answer to that question is gonna be, there's, there's several answers to that question. The first one is, uh, the first one to ask yourself is, has, is have, have I ever had it done? Have I ever had my, my propeller balanced? And if the answer to that is no, then probably ought to have it balanced. Uh, other times that you should have it done, 
uh, obviously, anytime you have a propeller overhaul, um, pretty much anytime you have a propeller removed for just about anything, uh, whether it be a reseal, uh, fixing a grease leak, uh, and especially if any blade work is done. And what I mean by that, did they profile the edges? Did they repaint the blades? Uh, anytime any major work like that is done, I highly recommend a, a dynamic balance be done afterwards. One thing to mention on fresh engines, I used to encourage uh, my owners to, to put at least 10, 15, maybe even 20 hours on that new engine before we did a balance. A uh, couple of reasons for that. One, uh, the balance procedure itself, you've got to run the engine pretty hard. Uh, and depending on how quickly you can get it to come in, you may need to run it four or five times. And that can be that can be tough on a on a on a fresh engine, especially on the rings. Uh, I'd rather see them broke in a little bit. But the other thing is during the break-in period, uh, if there's going to be any any changes within the engine, that's when it's usually going to occur. Uh, and there are slight changes uh, as far as things that are wearing in. Uh, but you want you want that stuff to get worn in prior to spending the time and the money uh, getting the prop balanced. Is my connection okay, or are we still bad? You're loud and clear this time. Um, everybody else, do you want to yeah. just poke into the chat window if it sounds good or bad? Yeah, it's much better. Good deal. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question for you before you carry on, if I may. Sure. Um, when you when you have a propeller and you send it to a shop and, they, and you ask for them to balance it, do they do some sort of static balance, or do they put it on a spinner and spin it? Curious about that. Uh, the, the most typical balance that's done in a shop is a static balance. Mm -hmm. um, there's I've talked to a few of my contemporaries that were looking at potentially building something where they could actually spin balance the propeller. Um, it, in reality, it really doesn't help anything. If you've got really good static balance equipment, you're going to get that propeller pretty dead gum close but you're still gonna be marrying that propeller with an engine. And the dynamic balance, what we're trying to accomplish there is we're, we're balancing that combination of the engine and the, and the propeller and the way that it mounts to the crankshaft. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so you're, you've got the, everything that's slinging around in the engine, you kind of uh, look at, it's both the propeller and sort of uh, a fine tuning on the engine. Uh, exactly. That one, right? the, the, you, well said. You, you are fine fine tuning the rotating system. Okay. When it comes to static balancers, unfortunately, not not all prop shops are equal. Um, when I had my shop, I had a, a very sensitive, very very expensive static balance system. Um, some guys are still using uh, old systems from World War II that are worn out. And they haven't been really calibrated or upgraded or taken care of, and, and they're 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 probably getting fairly close, but they're not extremely accurate. The balancer that I used was sensitive to safety wire, a piece of safety oh. wire. Is that is that SOP though, or do you have to ask for a balance when you take one in? No, it's it's it should be standard. Depend okay. dep again, depending on what you're having done. Um, if you're just having, uh, say, a little two-blade Hartzell prop, compact prop, leaking grease, they're going to pull it apart. They're going to clean it up. Um, more than likely, they're going to. There's some uh, Teflon strip that's around the blade shank. They're going to replace that. They're going to put it back together with new seals, new lubricants. Chances are they're not going to check the static balance because they haven't really done anything to change right. it. Um, if they do any, any, if they do any type of blade work. Absolutely, they need to, need to check uh, static balance. And obviously, the full-blown overhaul, they're, they're going to do static balance before it goes out the door. I had a, uh, a stroboscope balance on my uh, former airplane, the Grumman Tiger, and uh, I could feel the difference. It, it really does help. It's pretty, it was pretty significant for that airplane. And, and some, so I'd recommend sometimes it, it is going to be significant. You're really going to tell the difference. There's going to be times where, where you're not going to notice much of a difference. However, the, the airplane is going to notice the difference. Right. And that's really what's here. So a combination of yep. both. We want you guys. We want you guys as comfortable as possible up there, not getting worn out by vibration. 
but we definitely don't want that that engine and that airframe and that prop getting worn out by vibration especially these days with the kind of money you guys are spending on your panels we want to we don't want to we don't want to vibrate those new panels to death either <laughs> oh now you've got our attention <laughs> daryl money <laughs> um, I will just uh, add, this is CJ, that we put a prop balancing clinic together. In that case, it was the DynaVibe system um, used. And we had a 13 or 14 engines done. And the comments varied from, boy, I didn't know there was anything wrong, but my cracks in my airframe and exhaust systems just stopped, to my passenger says it's quieter to um, my engine seems happier to, boy, I didn't realize it could run this smooth. Um, we had two airplanes where they were checked and they did not need balancing, including one that had never been balanced. Um, and that was a surprise, but apparently not unheard of. And uh, just again, by getting a whole bunch of engines together and helping with the cowlings on the twins, because the singles didn't need cowlings removed, we were able to make the shop really efficient and they made us a big discount of $150 an engine, which was a big, big discount off the normal rate. So um, I said last time and I said again, well, if you have a local prop shop and by the way, a lot of people asked Daryl last time, and I'm just going to say this because we'll take care of this. There were five questions about how do I find a good local prop shop? And, uh, and one about do prop shops get, go to a certification process. So um, before I get back to some questions about grease, because there's a couple about grease and one about uh, tape, Daryl, do you want to just give these your answer about how they can contact you? I'm not wanting to put it into the public thing, but about your past with the being your presidency with the prop association and, and how people can ask you for recommendations. Sure. Uh, CJ and I talked about this last night. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to get on a public forum and, and talk about individual propeller shops and my opinion of them. <laughs> I'd be opening up myself for massive lawsuits. Um, but you guys are welcome to call me anytime. Uh, if you have questions about a prop shop, uh, if you have questions about propellers in general, um, I'll be, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. I, I pretty much know everybody across the country in, in the industry. I spent two years as the president of our Propeller Association. And actually, that's one of the good places to start. Um, you can take a look at the WAPA website, which is the World Aircraft Propeller Association. There will be a list of members on that website. Not that these shops get... Uh, any more type of scrutiny than, than other shops, but it does show that they care enough to join the organization and actually show up to the meetings, which to me means a lot. And the, the meetings that we had, we would have all the manufacturers come in, um, all the latest uh, service information from the manufacturers. Uh, we would have people like uh, Sherwin-Williams come in. Sherwin-Williams is the paint that's used by both McCulley and Hartzell. Hartzell. Um, MT uses PPG, which is automotive paint. Uh, but a lot of information uh, were at these typically three-day meetings that, that, that we would have. So if, if your shop is a member of WAPA, I think that's a, a good place to start. Um, Hartzell has uh, a very small group of shops across the country that they call their recommended repair facilities. Uh, you can look that up on the Hartzell website. Uh, the Hartzell website is also loaded with information. Um, you can actually, uh, if you have a Hartzell prop, there's a section where you can go in and, and type in your model number, and it will spit out every service bulletin, letter, instruction, and any AD note that applies to your propeller. Um, it can be pretty handy information for you. Uh, Hartzell's network of shops, those guys go through a probably a hundred times worse in-depth inspection than an FAA inspection. I used to be a part of that network and I know I mean, they, they send in their top people for almost a week. They go through every aspect of your operation. NDT, uh, your 
painting procedures, painting procedures, all your inspection procedures, all your paperwork, uh, they go through with a fine tooth comb. Uh, so in order to, to stay uh, in that realm of, of elite shops, you gotta be top of the top. So if you have a Harsel prop and you've got one of those recommended service facilities near you, highly recommend you use them. I will tell you, chances are they're gonna be a little bit more expensive. Um, in the prop world, you get what you pay for. Uh, from there, like I said, you guys are welcome to call me and I'll give you over the phone my suggestions, recommendations. Uh, you can always comb the internet and look for comments that other people may have made about a particular propeller shop. Um, the vast, the vast majority of them are 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 pretty good. Uh, I will say, there's still a few shops out there that I gotta honestly say I don't know how they stay open, but but they're there. Um, they actually will tend to close down in one location and pop up somewhere else in another state. And, and you may ask those questions. You know, how long have you been in business? You know, where have you been in business? But probably the number one thing that you can do is actually go visit the facility and ask them to take you on a tour through the facility. And I used to do this all the time. Um, in fact, a lot of times I would turn them loose with my chief inspector and let him do it, and he would wear them out. Uh, by the time he got through explaining everything that has to be done, all the different types of inspections, all the calibrations that we have to do on our own equipment, all the standard checks that we do daily on our NDT services, uh, they left with a pretty good impression of what we did. Um, if your shop doesn't even want to take you on a tour through their shop, I probably wouldn't use them. Uh, if you walk into a shop and it looks like a hell hole and there's crap everywhere and dirty and nasty, I probably wouldn't use them. Um, just little things like that that you can look for on your own. Uh, but I do highly recommend that if you have to use a, a, a propeller shop, and if it's possible for you to, to visit them, I would. I would definitely visit them, get to know the people that are there. Uh, you'll get a much better feel for what kind of work they're putting out. About all I got to say on that topic, CJ. Uh -huh. Cool. Um, before we get back to the grease questions, um, just a quick a question about something you you alluded to. You had mentioned that paperwork had changed through the years from two pages <laughs> to 45 pages. And yeah. because we have owners who are new and we also have owners who have had their airplanes from the 50s and 60s, and, and since prop service isn't always done all that often, can you help us understand the changes that our shops are undergoing due to regulations? Oh, absolutely. Um... Obviously, propeller shops operate under CFR 145, which is the rule that covers repair stations. Um, they are much heavy, much more regulated than your IAs or AMP mechanics out there. Uh, each repair station is assigned a primary inspector uh, with whatever FISDO is closest to that shop. And you, you can expect to see that primary inspector at a minimum once a year where he will come in and do a full blown audit of your shop, which is usually a two or three day, three day ordeal. But he also has the right to pop in on you pretty much anytime he wants to. Um, what has happened in, in, in the repair station world over the years is, is a function of not only incidents that have occurred, whether it be a, an all out failure or something that has been found during an inspection, um, it's just been accumulation of, of the years that we that we have discovered that we need we need more documentation on what's being done in these repair shops, uh, which has added a, a level of, of paperwork, a, a burden of paperwork that is pretty much unbelievable. Um, all that costs money. Uh, I started my prop career in 1980 uh, at age 16. So now you know how old I am if you're good at math. Uh, Back then, we had two pages to a work order. It didn't matter if it was a two-bladed prop off a Comanche 250 or a four-bladed prop off of a King Air 350. It didn't matter. We had one, book, one page that had all of your pertinent data of model numbers, serial numbers, uh, owner's name, disposition of the, of the job, 
And then we had a blade spec sheet. And the blade spec sheet was all the dimensional inspections on the blades. That's measuring the blades uh, at various places required by that particular blade model prior to re rework and then after rework. Well, that's all changed. Now that same King Air prop, that work order package is probably in the range of 45 to 50 pages because we have uh, with every major component, a traveler follows that component all the way through the process. What the tra traveler is, it's a step-by-step -step process of what's required to be done to that component from start to finish. So the technicians can go through the steps and actually sign them off as they're being done. We've got uh, NDT reports on all of your steel parts, NDT, NDT reports on all of your aluminum parts. So- Sorry, NDT? In, the, in the November Delta Tango. And I was gonna explain, in NDT is, that stands for non-destructive testing for those that don't know. Non-destructive testing is your, your various disciplines of being able to check a part for discontinuities. Discontinuities can be anything from a crack to a corrosion pit, to a, a forging lap, a tool mark, anything that, that could potentially lead to a crack and a failure. That those, those things are all found on aluminum parts. We're using a die penetrant system, looking for those uh, discontinuities. Steel parts, you're using a, everybody calls it Magnaflux, but Magnaflux is actually a brand name. It's called Magnetic Particle Inspection. And the, one of the newer technologies that's being heavily used now is what's called eddy current. And eddy current is a uh, small unit that uses a probe that you can run this probe over the surface of a part and actually see discontinuities that are subsurface. Um, pretty awesome technology. And it, it's gotten now to where it's reasonably priced where uh, you can afford to have that kind of technology in your shops. And there's also certain parts now that, that require an eddy current uh, inspection in conjunction with a die penetrant inspection. It's all those inspections that the, the NDT inspections are done uh, to ensure that there's not any type of a discontinuity in a highly stressed area of a propeller part that could potentially lead to a crack, which could lead to a failure, which could lead to loss of control of the aircraft. Um, for example, the propeller blade, believe it or not, once it goes through all of its rework procedures, that entire blade is submerged in a fluorescent dye. It goes through a dwell, dwell process. In other words, it, it, it has to rest with the dye on it for a certain period of time. It goes through a special rinsing process using uh, very particular temperatures of water in combination with an emulsifier at a very specific pressure for a very specific amount of time so that you don't over rinse the part. That part or blade in this case goes through a developing process where it's emerged in a developer, then it's sent through a dryer, and then it goes into a dark room. In the dark room, we've got high intensity black lights where we can shine these black lights on the surface of the part and find these discontinuities and either correct them or reject the part because it can't be corrected. Those are, those are just a few of the types of things that, that go on during overhaul. The paperwork has, has built up because all of this stuff is now tracked to make sure that it's getting done. So you've got paperwork uh, tracking all of this, documenting everything that's been done. Um, you now have, uh, in conjunction with your work order package, you have a, a, an actual list of anything that's outside of the overhaul manual. And what I mean by that is service instructions, letters, bulletins, AD notes, those are all printed off as well. And you have to go through each and every one of them and address whether or not one does it pertain to this particular assembly. If it does, what was done to comply with it and then a sign off. So a tremendous amount of paperwork, a tremendous amount of, 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 of traceability. Uh, and traceability comes into play on the new part side because a certain amount of new parts are gonna be installed in your propeller during overall. All those parts have to be traceable back to the manufacturer. Uh, it, it's very intense compared to the way it was 40 years ago. And for good reason. Um, it, it's all about increasing the level of safety. And I, I, you can go back and look at the data over the past 40 years. The, the safety factor has increased exponentially, at least in the propeller world. 
Um, still have a few people out there that, that aren't staying on top of them like they should. I saw a Bonanza yesterday for sale. Uh, the propeller hadn't been overhauled since 1980, 41 years. The engine though hadn't been overhauled since 1980, 41 years. And they still wanted $75,000 for this Bonanza. What were you buying? You're buying an airframe. And by the way, it had no avionic up, avionic upgrades in it. Pretty crazy. But just an example of, of some of the things that are still kind of going on out there. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, about the overhaul process and how much is truly involved so that you guys understand when you do take your propeller in, in for overhaul, it's not cheap. It is, it is not cheap. And, and a big part of it is, is the amount of time that's required in making sure that all the all the I's are, are dotted and the T's are crossed and all the paperwork. What else we got, CJ? Well, let's see, a couple of questions. Thank you for that. Um, just to read it back. So the inspection process, uh, for example, with dye pen, you said you're gonna immerse a, braid, immerse a blade in, in the whole entire blade in dye penetrant dye and then a special rinse so that it doesn't get over rinsed and then you put it in a developer uh -huh. and then a dryer and then you take it to a dark room and you inspect it with a black light the entire blade for any irregularities cracks or flaws that is correct wow and by the okay. way by the way the the only acceptable penetrant that is used now in, in aerospace with very few exceptions, there's still some AD notes that allow you to use visible red dye, but pretty much across the board, it's it's all fluorescent dyes now. And there's there's three levels of I'm sorry, four levels of sensitivity as far as fluorescent dyes go. Um, in a prop shop, you're required to run at a minimum sensitivity level three, with the highest being four. I ran four. I figured if my system's checked out at, at a sensitivity level of four, I'd be damn good at three. <laughs> of course, the higher you go up in the sensitivity level, the more uh, constraints you have on various parameters. Uh, also, the more expensive the chemicals become. And the, the way the way dye penetrant works, it, it works under capillary action. The penetrant itself is designed to penetrate, hence the term penetrant into these discontinuities and they call it capillary action just like capillaries that we have in our blood vessels it basically goes in into these uh, discontinuities one molecule at a time and they just follow the leader and once they get in there they're going to stay in there unless you really rinse the crap out of them uh, the rinsing process is just to get the surface uh, penetrance off so that when you go through the developing process that developing process pulls that penetrant back out of the discontinuity so it now becomes visible under the black light. It's, it's done properly, it's extremely effective technology. Good to know. The, um, if you've never, I've only seen the red stuff done checking for cracks in our um, landing gear strut housings. So the news that red is out and fluorescent is in is, is relevant and useful. Um, there were a couple of questions on grease. Um, what grease do you recommend? And somebody commented, good question, because mine shoots out grease when I cycle the prop. And in addition to that, there's one more question, which is there was a change in the grease instructions from pump grease in until it comes out the other side to put in a set amount. So the three questions are, what kind of grease do you recommend? Uh, why the change in the instructions from push it in until it comes out to just put a, a set amount in. And then just the question about what happens when you shoot out grease when you cycle the prop. Okay. We should be, we should be concerned. No, all, all, all very good questions. Um, and what I'm gonna have to do before we really get into it is explain a little bit the different kinds of, of Hartzell propellers that you can lubricate. Hartzell propeller is the only propeller that actually has Zerk fittings that you can lubricate. The only other exception to that is the old beach props that were used on some of the uh, early Bonanzas and some of the Navions, which we don't talk beat, we don't talk Bonanza in this forum. But anyway, back back to you guys. Some of you guys, especially some of you 250 guys and 180 guys, 
may still have the old Hartzell, what we call a steel hub propeller, where you've actually got blade clamps that go around the shank of the blade. You've got an external link arm that ties to the piston. That's what we call a steel. And you should have two Zerg fittings per blade clamp. On a steel hub propeller, what we want you to do is remove one Zerg fitting and actually purge all the grease out of it until you get clean, clean grease. The reason for that on the steel hub propellers is they're really bad about condensation forming inside the clamp. And we want to make sure we push all of that out. The one that you're talking about where you only want to put in a set of mount, that's the aluminum hub propellers. That's where you have two hub halves that are bolted together. And that's the more common propeller that you'll see. All of you 260 guys have that type of propeller. Um, some of the 250 guys do now. Uh, a lot of the 250 guys are going to have the, uh, the three blade McCulley conversion, which there is, you don't even need to listen to this conversation because there's no way to lubricate the McCulley's. That's all done when they're, when they're disassembled. But on the aluminum hub Hartzels, what I want you to do is remove the opposite Zerg fitting. And if you pump grease one pump and grease starts coming out the other side, you're done. That's all you need to do. All you're doing is making sure that you have grease in there. And at that point, clean everything up, put the Zerk fitting back in, put your little caps over the Zerk fittings, and you're done. Uh, we don't want to purge the aluminum hubs. Number one, we don't have the condensation issues with them. But if you get crazy with the grease guns on these aluminum hub props, there's a real high probability that you're going to end up filling up the entire hub cavity with grease. And we don't want that. We only want that grease out there on the, the far outermost pitch change bearing. This is, that's the bearing race or bearing system that the blade is actually actuating against. We don't want it to fill up the hub cavity. And I've seen it numerous times. When you do fill up the hub cavity, it's not going to take long. You're going to start leaking grease. But the other thing you're going to find is a very sluggish acting propeller. Uh, and it would, and it, the chances of it to start uh, surging on you go up because the governor is starting to fight this pitch change mechanism that's having, having to push its way, <coughs> excuse me, push its way through all of this grease. So you want to be careful with the aluminum hubs on, on not over greasing them. Now, if you start pumping and nothing's coming out, pretty good chance that you had a leak and you didn't know it, then all your grease is leaked out. Or your propeller shop forgot to put grease in it before they sent it out the door. That happened too. Never to me. <laughs> <laughs> it happened once. Now, types of grease. Parcel recently changed to a, a new grease uh, this has been the past couple of years, and if you have their new grease, you will have a great big decal somewhere on the propeller cylinder that, that will tell you this propeller has been lubricated, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I should have pulled up the service bulletin. If you do have the new Hartzell grease, it has to be serviced with that same grease. If not, there's a chance you're going to have a... Uh, a chemical reaction between the grease they're using now and, and whatever you pump in there. Not all greases are the same. The majority of Hartzell props out there are going to have either Aeroshell 5 or Aeroshell 6. Those two can intermix. Uh, there, there's not a problem intermixing those two. The Aeroshell 5 is a much thicker consistency grease. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. Aeroshell 6 is what we used very successfully for many, many years on propellers, the Aeroshell 6. You get into the Aeroshell 7, that's, that, that's a synthetic grease, and chances are you're going to swell the O-rings, and you're going to have all kinds of problems. Another nasty one is Aeroshell 22. Those are very specialized um, synthetic greases that you have to have the, the right types of O-rings and seals to accommodate the, the, the chemical makeup of that grease. O-rings are... Uh, very sensitive to, to whatever they're trying to hold back. That's about all I've got to say about grease. <laughs> wow. Other, I just... other than it's important, and I, and I will say, you guys that have the older Hartzell Steel Hub props, those props are going to leak grease. That's fairly normal. 
the newer uh, aluminum hub parcel props should not leak grease. If they leak grease, you need to you need to have that looked at. Because I've actually seen I've actually seen hub cracks in those uh, hubs, the older generation hubs, and the grease leak was coming through the crack. So do not neglect grease leaks on the Hartzell aluminum hub propellers. Okay, nice. Hi, Great. It, maybe it might be a dumb question, but uh, no dumb question. in my case, it's a Macaulay prop that I'm going to send in for overhaul. Is it is it usually a good idea to send in the governor as well, or is that a totally different animal? Um, it's pretty common to do it with the propeller. Okay. Uh, I would say if, if, it, if you don't have a record of it ever having been done, yeah, I would definitely get it done. No, it's well... I can't say how many hours, but it's about 11 years since install. Yeah. So it, and it does just by, <laughs> just by basic inspection need to, it needs a good overhaul. So, or at least to be Iran. It, it does. And, and governor overhaul is, is, is not that intense. Um, it's a hell of a lot easier than overhauling a propeller. I can tell you that. Okay. But the, the, the big thing to remember about, about calendar time, you know, gaskets and seals don't last forever. And that calendar time is what 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 gets get you on gaskets and seals. And you'll start developing leaks. You'll start getting leaks out of out of the control arms, out of the pilot valve. It, it's next thing you know, you got a mess underneath the cowling. Nobody likes that. Um, but governors are are very important. Um, the last thing you want is to have one complete, completely fail on you and send a bunch of metal through your engine. Uh, they do have a screen gasket to 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 prevent that from happening but I've still seen it happen. Um, I mean, a, a full-blown governor failure and, and you lose pitch control, you guys, most of you guys, the props that you have are gonna, are gonna revert to a flat pitch, which is your high RPM setting. And you're still gonna be able to manage to fly the airplane and get it down safely. Uh, the Bonanza is a little bit different animal. Uh, you lose pitch control on a Bonanza, that, that can be a very interesting day. Uh, that that that's, can become somewhat of a problem. You guys, a little bit different flight characteristics. It's not as huge a deal. But prop governors, it's nothing more than a, the oil pump that's taking engine oil pressure that's you know, 50, 60 PSI and boosting that oil pressure up to 300 PSI. And it's either sending it to the prop or it's dumping it back in the case. It just depends on whether, what, what your speed conditions are. Um, if, you need to slow, if the engine needs to slow itself down, it's gonna send that, that oil pressure to the prop, increase the blade angle, to slow the engine down. And that's a function, when you're in cruise level flight, flight remember that's, that's why it's called the constant speed. That function is taking place all the time. You're constantly adding and subtracting oil pressure to the prop to maintain that constant RPM. Because that's what's changing the blade angles as you go through different densities of air to maintain that RPM and hold that RPM at a specific spot. Speaking of RPM, one thing I, I mentioned last week, and I want to talk about it again because I just ran into it again this week. Tachometers, 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 tachometers. The newer electronic digital tachs typically don't have a lot of issue, but they still should be checked. Your older mechanical tachs are typically horrible. You need to check these tachometers or have somebody check them to make sure that they are reading accurately. If you have any kind of RPM restricted ranges that you shouldn't be operating in, if your tachometer isn't accurate, you have no idea whether or not you're operating in those ranges. You also have no idea if you ever ran into an overspeed condition, how much you actually over, oversped the engine. Overspeeding, overspeeding an engine propeller can be a very bad thing. In fact, a 10% overspeed is grounds completely scrap the propeller. Rare, but it, but it can happen. And if your tachometer is not accurate, you're gonna have no idea of whether or not it, it actually happened. And the reason for that, if you ever look at the, the curve or the graph for centrifugal load, it actually starts off cruising along fairly smooth and then it starts climbing. Once you start getting close to 2,900 RPM, it starts going straight up exponentially. So the loads that, that, that are inflicted on that propeller hub and the blade shanks goes through the roof. 
So if, if you ever experienced a, a 10%, so say your, your red line's 2,700, if it goes to 2,970, that's not good. So our 180s generally are 2,700, and I think our uh, people remind me that 250s and 260s, 2,600 and 2,500, depending. So it's 10%, Daryl, yeah. that we're into overspeed land. Yeah. And you said 10% overspeed for 10 minutes is grounds to scrap the prop? No, uh, not even a uh, not even a time limit. And actually, don't, wow. don't don't quote me on that. I need to go back and, and look at that chart again to make sure that it hadn't changed. And okay. Back back in my day, and, and so people know, I, I've, I've actually been out of the prop business for almost seven years, and stuff does change. But and, and actually, that's something that, that you, you can look up yourself on the Hartzell website. That's going you can find that in Service Letter sixty one sixty one Yankee. I do know that. And lot. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, I think you had mentioned that when you're getting your prop dynamically balanced at that point, can all of them check your tachometers? All of them that, I, that I've ever worked with, yes. So as part of our prop balancing, we can get our tack checked uh, sure. and otherwise just get it checked at annual? Um, to me, it should be a part of the annual inspection, yes. Because there's, so there's, everybody there's, we can... there's, lots, there's lots of equipment out there available that's not expensive that will actually uh, perform a tack check for you. One of the most common is what's called a view through tachometer. You actually are, are looking through a, a little unit. There's a wheel spinning in it and you adjust it to where you actually stop the prop in your view. And it will give you a, a digital readout of how fast the propeller is spinning. Mm -hmm. So. Good, good advice. Billy Brooks has an interesting question. Um, he has a 180. He said, I've had my prop balanced a few times and it seemed to help, but about six years ago, I replaced the engine shock mounts with aircraft spruce aerobatic shock mounts that were stiffer than the stock Lord mounts for the 180. And for the next year, there was a tremendous increase in vibration at all frequencies. After a year, replaced the aerobatic shock mounts with the appropriate Lord mounts for the 180 and the engine was smooth again. Would dynamic balancing have fixed the vibration caused by the stiffer aerobatic shock mounts? No, no. One thing you got to remember is uh, engine mounts, that, that's a whole technology all to itself. Um, these reciprocating engines create pulses and there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, let's face it, we're, we're taking raw fuel and burning it inside of a cylinder. And, and, and making everything spin. So you, you're, you're never gonna eliminate the, the pulses that are naturally created by a reciprocating engine. But to dampen that so that it doesn't transfer to the airframe, that's where the engine mounts come into play. And if you go to a, a rigid, stiff, aerobatic mount, you're gonna feel it. It's gonna feel completely different than what you're used to. I'm not cool. saying a dynamic balance wouldn't have helped, but it, it, it's going to feel different. I can, I can promise you that. So two different technologies covering related areas, essentially. Yes. Engine mounts and yes. rock balancing. Yes. Yeah, it, engine mounts, uh, probably one of the, the I'm not going to say the most neglected part of the airplane, because to me, that's the propellers. Uh, but they, they, they get overlooked <laughs> quite a bit. Um, I, I, and to me, it, it baffles me why you would do an engine change and not change the engine mounts, but it, it happens. They're not that expensive. I, I buy them all the time for our fleet of 172s because we're changing engines once a year. Well, that wow. wasn't the other year. <laughs> uh, a question from Josh Jensen. Do you have an opinion on prop guard, the tape for propeller leading edges? I do. Um, I got an opinion on everything, CJ. <laughs> I think it's a good. You don't product. say. I think it's a good product. Um, the manufacturers don't like it. I can tell you that. Um, and there's a couple of reasons they don't like it, and it's the same reason that that I've got some reservation about it. Uh, too many people will put prop guard tape on their props, 
and they'll leave it on there for 10 years. And that's probably the worst thing that you can do. Because what can happen is, is that prop guard tape can get penetrated. You, you won't even really notice it. Little bitty pinhole is all it really takes. And it'll damage the leading edge of the blade. And now you get moisture trapped up underneath there. And corrosion is going to start burrowing its way down into that leading edge of the blade. That is no different than having a, a rock nick. You've now, you now have induced a stress riser into the lead edge of that blade that, that nobody can see. What I recommend if you're going to use prop guard, you need to plan on changing it out every couple of years. If you do, if you'll do that, then, then I don't have a real problem with it. But if you're going to stick it on there and just leave it on there for, for forever, it's not a good plan in my opinion. Then also, if you leave it on there long enough, it's a bear to get back off. But if you if you change it every couple of years, uh, pull it off, inspect those leading edges, make sure that you don't have any damage that was not being seen. Uh, and if you find it, correct it, uh, clean it, repaint the leading edges, and, and put your tape back on again. That's my opinion on that. Speaking about, we talked about this last week on uh, repair of damage, uh, nicks and propeller blades. I actually drew, I don't know how well this is going to work, but I drew a little picture that hopefully will uh, make it a little clearer what I was talking about. For those that saw it, what I told you was anything over 3 16 of an inch in damage, you really ought to have a professional take a look at it. Anything less than that, it, it, you're perfectly legal to uh, address that yourself or have your mechanic take care of it for you. The key is, number one, getting all the damage out, getting all the way down to the bottom of it. The other is you want that repair to be 20 times the, the length of that repair to be 20 times the depth of the damage. I'm going to hold this up and hopefully you can see it. Looks good. See my little drawing? Depth of the damage, and then there's the repair. And that repair needs to be 20 times in length of whatever the depth of the damage was. In other words, we want to we want to stretch that repair out over an extended length of the blade. I know that looks like crap, but that's much safer than the top picture. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions about that picture? That looks like something important. Good deal. So three sixteenths and under, we can do it, or our A and P's can do it. Mm -hmm. Next, deeper than three sixteenths. And how does the fingernail rule tie into that three sixteenth? I don't have any fingernails. <laughs> uh, the fingernail rule being, if you run your fingers over the, the fingernail rule is the if you run your fingers uh, over your prop when you're when you're doing your walk around and it catches your fingernail, then it's a neck that's gonna to need to be addressed at annual or sooner if it's deeper than that. No, that's, that's a little extreme. In okay. My, in my opinion. But, but again, that, you know, is that fingernail calibrated? Does everybody have the same length of fingernail? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never really looked at your fingernails, DJ, but most women have fairly long fingernails. If you could stick your whole fingernail down in there, that's probably a problem. <laughs> but I, I, um, I keep mine really sharp because I have a bad habit of scratching my bald head. And if I don't keep them sh really short, I'll, I'll scratch my head and it'll hurt. Potentially bleed. <laughs> um, a question. Uh, let's see, I have a 3 16 inch dressing scar on one blade of my three bade Macaulay. That's about four inches from the tip. Um, what would you expect when they service when they overhaul it uh, mike newman do you want to jump in and just clarify your question yes um i have a a, a um a scar i had a nick in the prop dress it out it's three sixteenths to a quarter inch uh deep my mechanic dress it out i'm wondering uh, when I, i'm going to send it in shortly for um I'm just wondering if I'm going to need three blades. Do they have to match the weights of the blades uh, if they have to replace one of the blades? Um, excellent question. 
here's here's what here's what I recommend. Um, be very proactive with your propeller shop. If if the one blade that has the damage, if it can be properly um, recontoured back to original shape and still be uh, a legal blade, still pass dimensional inspection, that's great. But keep in mind, they're going to have to take the other two blades down to match it. You may want to take a look at replacing that blade with one that is more uh, dimensionally uh, in line with the, with the, your other two blades, if they can find one. Um, and they probably can. There, there's, there's surplus blades floating around out there. But my point being is if you can avoid having them take those other two blades down to match it, you're better off. Because in effect, what you're doing is you're reducing the, the life of your other two blades. Yeah. It does. I understand. I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid they're going to want to replace that one. And I thought if they replace one, they would have to replace all. Three. Oh, not at all. No, no. Okay. It, yeah, it's quite common to replace just one. In fact, um, uh, there's a chance they, they can look at the, the weight data information that's stamped on the blade butts. They can actually call the Macaulay factory and see if they have a, a similar blade mm -hmm. stock. Um, Macaulay will have various blade models uh, of individual blades that as they go through production may not meet the dimensional requirements of, of or they may not fit in with any other sets and they'll, they'll set those aside Hartzell does the same thing they'll set those aside and those, those are basically replacement blades for future use for people that are going to need them um, now once if you, if you do have to go with a new blade there is a chance that your shop will have to do a little rework on it to mate it in with the other two blades. Yes. Both for balance and also for aerodynamic considerations, getting those dimensions tightened up so that they're all uh, within a certain parameter as far as your width and thickness. But yeah, that you three, three sixteenths to a quarter of an inch. That, that's pretty significant. Uh, it is. If the if those prop if those if that prop hadn't been through an overhaul. I can probably safely say that that blade should pass an overall, but it's going to be probably down to, to marginal dimensions to where more than likely it won't make another overhaul after that. Yeah, it's has, um, it has not been overhauled probably cl a close to a thousand hours on it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a three blade Macaulay on a 250? Yes. The, yes. The, C, the C412? Uh, yes. The 90, 90 DA-3.5 blade, if I remember right. Yeah, there should be some blades out there in the used world. Um, it's not that uncommon for for a prop to you know have one blade take a major hit, and insurance company replace the whole prop, and the prop shop ends up with the core. No, if the blade was damaged beyond repair, they got to scrap the hub. But those other two blades are still usable. Yes. Okay. Good. And if, Thank you. And don't don't hesitate to call me. I don't I don't mind helping you out if you get a situation where you need to find a blade. I still have a lot of contacts. I'll be happy to help you. Okay, great. Thanks. My pleasure. Yep. So, uh, Sir St. Hilaire, uh, you had asked, do you have info for us Canadians? And I wanted to invite you or the, uh, we have quite a few Canadians here. Do you, if people wanted to just jump in, there's a, what, what emerged last week was that there's quite a distinction between the American and Canadian requirements <laughs> relating to prop servicing and overhaul. Serge, do you want to expand on your question? I wasn't quite sure what you meant. Yeah, yeah I was just looking at my props going to be due uh, uh, in a little while. In Canada, we have to do the, the inspections, the overhauls, that is. And I was just wondering, you said you had a lot of contacts in the States. I was wondering, Canada-wise, if you have shops to recommend or contacts in Canada. Hey, yeah, I know some Canadians up there. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what shop in particular? Well, I was gonna say, I'm just a, I'm a new aircraft owner, so I'm just, uh, I'm in Quebec, and I don't mind if I have to go out a bit of my ways to get have a good, reputable shop uh, do the overhaul. I'm just wondering if you have any. I wonder any... where uh, wonder where Hope Arrow is in regard in relation to you. Hope, mm -hmm. Hope Arrow is a really good shop. 
Um, give me a second here. Come on, phone. What I'm doing is I'm looking up uh, the Hartzell repair, uh, recommended repair station list. I, I can play. I can place the guy. I know his first name, but I can't remember the name of the shop. Maurice. So I'm guessing the WAPA site you mentioned would have the Canadian. Yeah. They would have as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And actually, Daryl, while we're at it, because there are so many people who needed prop shops, do you want to just state the phone number you'd like to have people call to get prop shop recommendations? Sure. My, uh, my personal cell number is 281. Seven two eight eight seven three two. But there is there is a caveat involved here, CJ. We're listening. There's a good chance when you call, I'm going to talk to you about electronic ignition too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're warned. No, but I, 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 I am serious. I, I don't mind. I don't mind helping people at all. I really don't. I mean, this, this is something to me. And I don't. I don't have a, a dog in the hunt anymore. I don't have my shop anymore. But it, it's important stuff. Um, like I mentioned last week, you've got three type certificates to these airplanes. You've got an airframe, you got an engine, and you got a propeller, and they're all equally important. Mm -hmm. Daryl, throw your phone number out, will you? You ready? You just did. I'll say oh, it. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's going to be area code 281-728-8732. Daryl is spelled D-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. My last name is Pool, P-O-O-L. Gotcha. Two, the, name, two the, name, the name of my company is Smooth Power LLC. Okay. 281 728 87, 87, 87, 32. 32. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. And uh, just going back, I had missed a question. This is CJ again. Uh, Gary Gray had asked a really good question. And if you had already answered this, I apologize. Where are the weights installed when balancing the prop? on the Comanches where we have the, uh, the ring gear there. A lot of guys will use the starter ring gear to mount the weights. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's perfectly legal, perfectly common to do. I'm personally, I wasn't a big fan of it. I mounted a, a couple of different places I mounted weights. Since I had a propeller shop, it was legal for me to, to actually manipulate the static weights on the propeller. Uh, and a lot of times I would do that. Uh, I could actually, in a lot of cases, get the dynamic balance done just via static weights on the propeller. Um, on the Hartzels, you've got weights that attach to the, the sides of the, of the hub and also where the blade uh, comes out of the hub. On the Macaulay's, you've got a ring that goes around the pitch chain cylinder where you attach weights. The problem on the Macaulay is where they attach the weights for static balance it's so close to center it takes a lot of weight to make a change on the Hartzell props that the the weight mounting point is further from center so it wouldn't take as much weight to to make a significant change the other most common place is to actually drill a hole in your spinner bulkhead and mount your weights there but starter ring gear is is uh, perfectly okay they just need to make damn sure that they rotate that prop through and make sure that they're not going to hit anything with that stack of weights. <laughs> gotcha. So basically an A&P would put weights on the ring gear, ring, but ring, if a prop shop's doing it, oh, go ahead. A, a, an A&P doing a balance legally can attach weights to the starter ring gear or to the spinner bulkhead. 
They are not supposed to manipulate static weights. Don't ask me why. That's just the way the reg regulations are. But a prop shop will tend to do a prop balance and adjust the static weights. Yes. Yes. Okay. That is new news. It's, it's just um, easier and less time consuming. I mean, any any time you got to start drilling into a, a spinner bulkhead, there's there's can be a lot involved in that. Got to make sure you're doing it in the proper locations. You're not going to hit anything. Once the hole is drilled, it's got to be properly cleaned and dressed so that there's no sharp edges. Uh, and it just it just takes time. Of course, I used to freak people out all the time because I would I would temporarily mount weights on the spinner screws. So you'd have the you know stack of washers on a spinner screw, maybe two stacks if something were really out of balance. And I'd say, well, we're all done. And they'd look at that and really gonna leave those weights on there like that? Well, sure, you don't like that? <laughs> Daryl, we can tell you have a cruel streak. I do. Mm. I have a question for you. Sure. Is, is it uh, at all common for propeller shops to uh, pick up your your propeller at your airport and then deliver it back to you? Um, most shops do. Uh, when mm -hmm. I had mine, I had three trucks on the road all the time because it, it, okay. propeller propellers are, are not the easiest thing in the world to ship. Unless you've got the proper containers. I mean, Hartzell and Macaulay, obviously, they're shipping propellers every day, so they have special containers built specifically for them to ship their propellers. Um, I used to keep a lot of those boxes on new props that would come in uh, to use to ship out props that we sold. No telling where. I used to sell a lot of propellers uh, to other parts of the country. Uh, but as far as my, when I had my shop here in Houston, my my range was uh, as far as you could go west in Texas into New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana was about as far as we would go. I have my Macaulay uh, three blade uh, picked up here at at my airport. Well, I live on the airport actually too. So it's uh, from an aircraft propeller service out of the Chicago area. Yeah. They when they when they returned it. The uh, guy who delivered it actually helped me mount it out of the airplane because wow. it's a bugger getting that heavy thing lined up and written down there. The, the, original, the, original, the original owner of that shop, the gentleman by the name of John DeJoris, John and I are we're very close friends. I, I haven't seen him in a couple of years. I hope he's doing okay through all this pandemic, but uh, excellent shop. Good choice. I was pleased with him. What, Thank you. What's the name of that shop? Aircraft Propeller Service. They're in uh, Lake Zurich, Illinois, near Chicago. Okay. I'm in Wisconsin, and uh, I don't remember the name of the place, but I think it's across the lake in Michigan where they'll, they'll come out. And, and if, you know, if you're doing any networking, I, you know, there's always there's a few people around here that have props, and we try to time it when we do you're it. You're in Wisconsin. It's the right place because I'm in yeah. one key Wisconsin right here, man. Yeah. So. Okay. And we are about to drift into the um, how to select the right propeller for your airplane. Um, but before we go there, just a couple of remaining questions. Uh, anything specific to the twin feathering props? Um, yeah, but people don't like doing what I ask them to do with feathering props. <laughs> Okay, we're warned. Okay, we are steeled for the bad news. Go ahead. Unless, unless you're comfortable actually feathering a prop in flight, don't do it. Um, but it's not a bad thing to do every now and then. What happens on a, on a feathering prop up in the pitch chain cylinder, because it doesn't feather all the time, your, your pitch chain cylinder is like a great big centrifuge. And you've got all this oil up there that, that doesn't circulate very much but you, you still have contaminants in that oil and they will sling out to the sides of the pitch chain cylinder and attach themselves. And I've actually seen a few situations where there was so much gunk in those pitch chain cylinders that when they did need to feather or call for feather, they wouldn't feather. They couldn't push all that junk out of the way. Um, the, about the only other thing you can do short of, of feathering it in flight is you can really piss off your mechanic and feather them on shutdown 
and let them figure out how to get them out of feather. But at, at least you're pushing all that, that crud back out of that cylinder. Um, and they can get them back out of feather. It's not that hard to do. But it, 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 it's a good idea maybe once a year to, to feather the prop uh, and get that stuff pushed out of there so that if you ever did need it, you would have it. Canadian propeller, that's a good one. I'm looking at this on my screen. Actually, most all the shops in Canada are really good shops. They're under a lot more scrutiny than our shops are down here. They just all have they just all have really bad beer drinking habits. I can't keep up with them. <laughs> now we know. Arrive prepared to raise a glass. Um, other questions. Just a comment. Uh, NICO N Y C O G N thirty fifty eight is the new grease code. That's it. Um, question before we go off of greasing, should prop grease be inserted in the leading or trailing edge of the blade? Um, depends on what generation hub you have. And that actually brings up a really good point. The older Hartzell hubs, the Zerk fitting was up on the hub arm, or up on the hub arm uh, as opposed to the, the current generation Hartzell propellers. The Zerk fitting is down in a, a beefier part of the hub close to the parting line where the two hub halves come together. Um, if it's up on the hub arm, I would grease from the front to the back. It's just easier. If it's down, if it's a newer generation hub and it's down there on the parting line, uh, a, a little extra side note that I need to add. The, the hole for those Zerk fittings, it starts out at, at a, a what is it, a quarter inch, quarter inch hole for the Zerk fitting, but then that hole narrows down to uh, an eighth inch. And it's a very small hole before it actually gets to the, the pitch change bearing. On that particular hub style, it really doesn't matter lead edge to trail edge, but what I, what I need you to do is when you take that Zerk fitting out, um, take something preferably plastic I used to use the little plastic straws that would come on a can of uh, brake cleaner. Go in there and stick it down in that hole and break up that grease in there because it will harden in there and, and actually become a plug. So when you go to, to, to start pushing grease through there, it doesn't want to come out. And you won't see any grease and you won't see any grease. Well, the grease is going in, but what it's doing is crawling up over the preload plate and filling up the hub. So it's a good idea to go in there and clean that hole out on these newer style hubs before you before you lubricate. Does that make sense? It does. And can you say again what you suggest can be used to break up, to, go in that little hole and break it up? Know, these cans of, of spray cleaner, like brake cleaner, or they come with a little extension straw that you can attach to the, the spray nozzle. Of course, we used to have. Oh, yeah, WD-40 often comes with a little red yeah. thin straw. WD like that. That that little straw oh, works really good. But okay. WD-40 is a bad word. Don't use WD-40 on your airplanes. <laughs> good caution. Not it's not a good product. You want to use either a Corrosion X, a CRC product like a 336. My favorite is ACF 50 as far as your, your spray corrosion lubricant type protection. WD-40. Okay. WD corrosion X or APF-50? ACF-50. Charlie Foxtrot, ACF-50. Great product. And then the CRC, uh, their thin silicon corrosion lubricant is a 336, CR CRC-336. Good. So what were we talking about? Uh, we were about to talk about. About? We are about to talk about <laughs> um, selecting the right propeller for your airplane. Um, and then we have some specific questions. And these include questions like, are the advantages of the scimitar blades really worth the extra cost? Um, I got 
three blade MTs for my airplane. Please tell me it was worth it. Uh, I'm flying out of a really short strip. What do I want to put on my airplane? Um, short strip, trying to get power, trying to get out. More blades, the better. Um, on scimitar designs, uh, yes, I'm a big believer in them. They're quieter. Uh, they're a more efficient airfoil. Um, about the only drawback to them is they're not uh, as beefy as some of the old designs, so you're not going to have the long-term repairability. Uh, but they'll, they'll still make a couple of overhauls very easily unless they're really abused. Uh, Hartzell's technology is called a blended airfoil. Uh, and it's a combination of, of a, a new airfoil design into a seminar, a seminar, scimitar tip design. Uh, it, it's all about making the most efficient airfoils they possibly can um, and still maintain the integrity of the blade. Uh, as far as MT goes, obviously I know those folks well. Um, in their minds, they build the greatest propellers in the world. Uh, they are good propellers. They, they perform well. The only thing I caution you on two things. Uh, the trailing edges of MT blades are extremely fragile. Be careful around your propellers. Don't hit them with a wrench. Don't drag a fuel line across, holes across them. Just be really cognizant of the fact that those trailing edges get damaged really easily. Um, and it's repairable, but it's a pain in the butt. Um, MT propellers in the long run, as far as overhauls, they're extremely labor intensive. They're going to cost a bunch of money to overhaul. Um, but do they perform? Sure, they perform. Are they lightweight? Yes, they're lightweight. Um, Hartzell, in, Hartzell in particular is pretty much on the heels of MT when it comes to composite technology. Hartzell's technology is all man-made, all carbon fiber technology. Um, Originally, it was pretty much cost prohibitive for the GA market. Uh, that is changing. Um, you're going to start seeing more and more composite uh, Hartzell props available uh, for various types of GA aircraft. Obviously, the uh, Cirrus SR-22 comes from the factory with a, with a Hartzell three blade, uh, very wide cord, scimitar, uh, composite, all composite blade. Uh, um, I think if it's not out already, there's an STC coming out for the Bonanza guys from Hartzell with a very similar blade as the, as the uh, SR-22, all composite blade. The advantages of going composite over an aluminum blade, the composite, the composite blades are pretty much uh, uh, limitless when it comes to life. Um, they have replaceable leading edges. Uh, leading edges get damaged, they can be replaced. Uh, it, it, there's not a lot short of running into a uh, stop sign with the prop or the ground that's going to going to scrap that blade. They're they're very rugged uh, and they're going to last the test of time. Whereas an aluminum blade, like we've discussed over time, it, it, it's as it goes through filing in the field, goes through overhauls, those blades get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they eventually reach a point that they no longer will meet dimensional specifications and they get retired from service. Uh, that's not that's not the case with, with the uh, composite props. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the lightweight composite props are a big benefit for airplanes that are they're nose heavy anyway. They can be a detriment for an airplane that need, need, ouch, needs the extra weight up there. I shouldn't play with my letter opener while I'm talking. That hurt. <laughs> oh. I'll, I'll put pressure on that. It'll quit bleeding here in a minute. Um, but as far as, as the different manufacturers, they're all very good. Uh, they all got, they, it's kind of like, a, I used to use the analogy, you can compare a Ford truck to a Chevy truck to a Dodge truck. They're, they're all a truck. They all get the job done. Uh, but some are a little bit more smoother to ride in. Some are a little bit more rugged. Some are going to last longer. Some are going to get better mileage. And it's kind of the same thing in the prop world. They, they all get the job done, uh, but there's nuances, obviously, to each and every one of them. Uh, as far as, as, as making upgrades to propellers, 
you guys that, that have the old steel hub parcel propellers, uh, if you if they've been modified to what's called the MV configuration and you're no longer affected by AD note 971802, I say rock on, keep keep on going. Just take good care of them. Uh, they need to be a little bit more attention than aluminum hub prop, just because you got a lot of dissimilar metal situations going on there. Uh, make sure that you keep the blade clamps purged, that you don't have any moisture built build up in those blade clamps. Uh, but as far as is is going from a two blade to a three blade, is it a, is it a wise choice? It just depends on the aircraft and depends on what you're what you're wanting to achieve. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of three blade props on, on four cylinder engines. Uh, it, it, it's kind of pushing the limit of what that, that, that four cylinder engine can, can do. Uh, six cylinder applications, I, I personally prefer a three blade prop. They're just so much smoother, so much quieter. Uh, you're gonna get a little bit better climb performance out of them. Uh, you may lose a little bit of your, your top end cruise speed and that's just because you got one more blade you're having to push through the air. Uh, a two blade prop is always going to be faster. A single blade prop is going to be the fastest. And actually, they existed at one time. Uh, just awful, awful hard to uh, keep them in balance. But it, it's, it, it really comes down to personal preference. Uh, some of the stuff is aesthetic, no doubt about it. Um, the Hartzell Q tip propellers that you see on some of the twin Comanches, they do actually work, they are quieter. Um, I'm not that huge a fan of them because they're to rework those blades from the technical side. It's a pain in the rear to, to try and polish around those, those Q-tip uh, blades and make sure that you're not gouging into them and taking too much material out. It's, it's quite a trick to rework those blades. Um, really about it, unless somebody's got some specific questions on, on different props. On I'm going to open up the floor on those questions. Go ahead. On a three blade prop, what's the expected ips? Should I, what, what should I expect out of it? Because right now I got a three blade prop, prop that's slinging a little bit of grease and my mechanics recommended a three blade prop. What can I expect out of as far as You've the got minimum it. ips I should be able to get? You've got a two blade now? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, and you're looking at going to a three blade? Yes. Uh huh. This is on, on a Comanche 250? Uh, C model, 260. Oh, oh okay. Uh, you can expect a, a, a quieter ride. Uh, mm -hmm. The diameter is a little bit shorter, and most of your noise is going to come from diameter. So you're, you're reducing that diameter, it's going to give you a little bit more ground clearance. The tips. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to have. Uh, a little bit more thrust as far as your climb. Uh, don't expect it to be any faster. Uh, the other big thing that's hmm. did, that, okay. that talked about a lot, uh, and it got brought to my attention by a female pilot on a Cherokee 6 one time, I sold her a three blade conversion for her airplane. Her two blade prop was beyond economical repair. And the first time she landed the airplane, she immediately called me and she was not happy. And I, huh. what's, what's wrong? You know, is the prop not working right? So you didn't warn me that this thing is going to slow down about twice as fast as it normally does. On a three on blade. On a three blade. It, you're going huh. you're gonna to slow down quicker in the pattern. Mm -hmm. It's like having a speed break out there. Mm -hmm. The things to look for when you go to a three blade prop is uh, uh, that's something you need to be aware of. It's something to be thinking about especially the first time you come in for a landing, just know that you're going to slow down a little bit quicker than you did before. Okay. But, other, other than but the, I can still, other than I the, can still expect it to be balanced uh, below uh, 0.1 ips, huh? Say that again? I can still expect it to be balanced between, between, below 0.1 ips. I would hope so. Okay. Hmm. My, my, uh, my personal goals were below 0.05. Hmm. Okay. And it, it is typ it's typically doable on a six-cylinder engine. The little four-cylinder hmm. engines, not so much, because you're you're really fighting it. You're, you're more fighting an ignition issue than anything. Mm -hmm. Which my ignition, hmm. my ignition system takes care of that, by the way. 
Yeah, for sale, huh? Just for sale. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You do realize we're setting you're setting uh, me up to make sure we negotiate a really great group by special on the electro air again and propellers. So coming at you. Um, I do want to take a moment uh, to just recognize it's 35 years since the Challenger disaster and astronaut Katie Coleman is actually on or was on our Zoom uh, right now with Josh Simpson. We just want to thank Katie for for you know being an astronaut and serving uh, our country as one and to recognize the moment the, the Challenger disaster. I think they jumped off just a little bit ago. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Um, but it's something I think that almost all airmen and your woman find uh, important. So, yeah, I saw them. I know on, I did. Yeah, I saw them on just a little bit ago, but then they jumped in. It's one of the Good things deal. I'll always remember where I was. I was sitting in a psychology class in college when that happened. Oh, question. I'm wondering, wondering why I was in a psychology class. <laughs> yeah, uh, question here. I missed last week's opening and someone just mentioned a numeric value having to do with balancing. I did not understand what are the units of measure on that numeric value of 0.1 or 0.05? What that is, uh, vibration is measured in IPS, which stands for inches per second. Gotcha. And what we wanna see on a, on a prop balance, the, the typical norm is anything below point one? <laughs> We've got an open mic. Um, <laughs> so at this point, it's nine o'clock. Um, we are. <laughs> we've got people texting all the places they were when the uh, Challenger disaster happened. I think everybody just remembers exactly. I know I remember where I was. I think everybody remembers exactly where they were. Um, and Billy Brooks just commented, and this supports, I think, Daryl, what you just said. He tried a three blade on his 180 and got increased vibrations to return to uh, his previous two blade. Um, Jim Walcott asked a really interesting question. Is a three blade prop tougher on the starter? No, not necessarily. You, you, you got to remember during the start sequence, once, once you get the propeller turning, that, that the blades are actually helping to pull, push the engine through. The weight of the blade is actually, as it's coming over top, it, it becomes part of the helping the starter along. I mean, it's not, it's not dramatic, but it, there is a certain amount of gyroscopic that is already starting to occur. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a just question. Drop, just uh, drop one on yourself one time and you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a question that I wonder if you could answer it. Uh, back once upon a time in the on the larger engines, Piper, like the, uh, the 260s and 300s, I don't know if this was the case in the Comanches, but it definitely was the case on the Lances, Cherokee Sixes, and the like. Um, they offered an optional, quote, high altitude propeller. It was a two bladed propeller, for example, on an IO 300, um, IO 540 rather. It was 84 inches rather than 80, 80 inches. I assume that'd be louder, but that, does it really uh, provide greater high altitude performance? I don't quite understand why the longer prop would be better. Yeah, it should be, should be the other way around. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the short the shorter propeller is going to give you better performance at altitude. Interesting. Okay, so the the long one was the, the they must have shown. The, think of think of, the reality of it is it, it, once you once you climb out and, and level off to your 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 cruising altitude, if you could chop off six eight inches of the blade, you'd be better off. Because that that section of the blade is what's what's doing all the work to get you get you up there. You don't really need that anymore. You just got but, rid of it. If you just got rid of it, you'd be better off. But if, but for for high density altitude takeoff, is the longer prop better? Yes. Oh yes. Absolutely. Okay. So 
that's why they labeled it high altitude. It was better for high high density altitude takeoff, but not for cruise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the more more diameter, the the more thrust. The more but it'll be slower. Thrust. Typically slower at cruise, less thrust. It's going to be slower in cruise because that part of the blade, you really don't need it anymore. It, it's now become a speed break, so to speak. Understood. It's slowing you down. Nice airplane back there, yeah. by the way. Oh, thank you. That's my twin Comanche. Mm -hmm. And just discovered today, it's still insurable. I was quite shocked. Insurance went down from last year. Uh, don't, say that too, don't say that too loudly. You're one of the few. I don't know why. It may be that it's finally changing. This the the insurance. Sorry, this is CJ again. A lot of people, well, a, a couple of key prescient people had asked me to start working on a group buy, so we ended up really plugged into a couple of in underwriters and and agencies, and they basically just said about a year ago things have gone crazier than we've seen it in decades. So basically, hang on for a wild ride. Um, a lot of our older pilots really got uh, hammered in terrible ways, um, and it looks like things may be starting to improve. We'll have a Comanche Zoom on that in the not too distant future. Uh, back to propellers. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to I, put out a word of slight encouragement. Mark, that's good so, news. I was so shocked by that email two hours ago with a quote. I was like, what? I wanted to pass it, went it on. Down. Yeah, it went you down. You are the first wind Comanche driver that I've heard of where the rates went down. So that's really, i am got my fingers crossed that that is true for more than you. You know, I question the twin Comanche. You know, I've only seen one twin with the three bladed prop on it. It looks kind of funny because it's a very small prop. Um, on your comment on a four cylinder engine, I would be kind of reluctant to put a three bladed prop on that, you know, IO320. Um, the, the three blade prop that you saw on the IO320 is a is, that's an MT propeller. That's a German yes. made propeller, all composite. But, well, they call it a natural composite blade. Uh, here in the states, we call it wood. They're made of they they're made <laughs> the, the the blades are like uh, World War One vintage the way they're right. constructed. It's a it's a wood laminate, so they're they're super lightweight. So in, in that case, and I, I've actually got a friend in Oklahoma that has a twin Comanche with the three blade MTs. He's also got our electro air ignition systems on his. He loves it. It's the smoothest twin Comanche he's ever flown. You can you can get away with going with a three blade prop when you go to a composite. On, because on, it's light. On these, because okay. it's lightweight on these smaller engines. Yes. How much weight do you save? Total of, per prop. Um, and I'm just guessing probably 20 pounds aside, maybe 25. Aside? Yeah. So the twin Comanche, you'd be saving 40 to 50 pounds? Yeah. Probably pretty close. Wow. To that. You can actually you can that's actually research that yourself. You you can find out the weight of your the, the props that you have are the uh, Hartzell HC uh, E2YL2s. Right. Uh, if I can yes. chime in for a sec, I, uh, I actually just bought some MTs and I have the STC information. Now, if the props do weigh exactly what it says on the STC, uh, it only saves 2.3 pounds per side or 4.6 total. Are you serious? Uh, yeah, that's that's all I got. It could be It could be different. I don't know. I would, that's not what I would have guessed. Wow. Yeah. I know those those little those little three blade MT props. I can pick them up like a six pack <laughs> with one hand and carry them across the shop. They're lightweight. We have a uh, sky bolt and it had a two blade uh, metal prop that weighed forty five pounds. Put a uh, uh, composite three blade on it, and that uh, three blade was only fifteen pounds. You know what? I probably read the uh, the uh, equipment information wrong, uh, and from from my uh, POH, maybe it was per uh, propeller uh, that uh, the Hartzells, you know, each weighed a certain amount, and now the MTs uh, are effectively half of that. I might have read it wrong. 
Well, and I and I I may have may have been way off mark. That's just what I was thinking in my mind, based on picking those propellers up for all my career. But I never really threw them on a scale. But it's definitely going to be lighter. There's no doubt. It's going to be lighter. How does the composite hold up with? Is is it more susceptible to damage from ice? From ice? Yes. Well, we would hope you wouldn't have ice on those blades. That's a bad thing. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it, there are times when you're going to pick and start slinging. You pick up some. Um, and typically not because that that type of damage is going to be it's going to be attacking the leading edges. And the composite blades, uh, uh, they use, I'm trying to remember, it, MT, I think, is a, an all stainless steel leading edge. Parcel uses a combination of a cobalt stainless leading edge. They're, they're pretty tough. Oh, that's what's got a shield on it. That's right, like a, like a, a prop guard, but it's metal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of envisioned the old Sensenic wooden propellers, which are still made, by the way, on your old vintage aircraft. You can actually see the the, the metal uh, shielding. In those days, they used brass on the lead edge but of the propellers. The hard cell prop, when it's made, is it made over a foam core, or is it just investment cast? It's a foam the way it is. Core. Yeah, it's a foam. Yeah, I'm saying it's a foam core. Foam. Sure is. Whereas the MT is a solid wood laminate. They do actually have some. Uh, uh, composite man-made material that they use in the shank area where it actually attaches to what's called the blade ferrule. The blade ferrule is an aluminum uh, spud, so to speak, that goes over the blade shank. You've got lag bolts that run through that into the blade to hold the blade in. You just got to keep an eye on termites. <laughs> You would probably know, but at the hub, and let's say a two-bladed prop, like the prop on the twin Comanche, uh -huh. how many how many G's is that blade actually experienced there? As far as, as centrifugal loading, trying to leave, 20, yes, it's twenty tons of pressure. Holy moly! <laughs> when you're when you're a at full power, it's about twenty tons, forty thousand pounds of pressure. That's but you remember that's just one of the forces working on it. You've also got CTM, which is centrifugal twisting moment, trying to make the blades be as flat as they can be. And then you've got your forward flex of the blades, which actually creates a tearing action on the back sides of the hubs. These blades, these blades flex a lot more than you realize. That's why they're not 35 bucks each. Well, I take that's it. correct. That's that's one reason. Main reason for the price of all this stuff is liability. I'll be honest with you. Well, how frequently does a does a GA airplane, you know, throw a blade? You don't. When it's, it happens, it's catastrophic. We don't hear it very it's often. It's become more and more rare. And you, you you can thank WAPA, the World Aircraft Propeller Association, the manufacturers, and and the FAA for it. It's just been. Uh, probably done a much better job of educating you guys on, on what can happen. Um, they've done a better job of monitoring shops that, that actually do these overhauls uh, and repairs. Uh, and I, I think that the general flying public has just become more aware and doing a better job of, of taking care of their equipment. I mean, let's face it, the average age of an airplane in this country from a brand new 737 coming off the line down to the oldest airplane still flying is up to about 55 years of age now, something like that. Nobody ever expected these airplanes to still be flying, but but here we are. And the only thing that keeps them flying is money. AMUs. And use. <laughs> and use. That's the worst thing you can do, as you all know, is park an airplane. They will deteriorate in a, in a hurry. We got any more prop questions? Yeah, I, I, um, I replaced on my early uh, 250, replaced the Hartzell with a three-blade Macaulay mm -hmm. uh, close to 10 years ago. And uh, I'll echo that the uh, takeoff is a lot snappier. A takeoff and climber both snappier. Uh, 
I measured no change in high altitude crews. Well, um, well it, it, it may be the way I fly. I tend to go up to 10 or 12,000 feet and put the uh, propeller into overdrive. So I'm chugging along about 1800 RPM, which is 160, just shy of 160 miles an hour and uh, down around eight or less gallons per hour. So I'm knocking off 20 miles per gallon and the engine's very smooth, but the Macaulay was significantly more, um, uh, uh, more vibration uh, on my engine at uh, roughly 2200 RPM than the Hartzell. So I changed the engine mounts to some that Macaulay had recommended for the purpose, actually two out of uh, all of the uh, hockey pucks uh, were changed to to a um, one that's used, I think, on some of the 260s, and that helped, but it didn't get rid of the vibration. The, the rotating inertia of the Macaulay is less, the propeller weighs less, its rotating inertia is less, and so that's going to change things. I presume the three-bladed Hartzels would uh, be that way also, but there was also a difference in the um, the engine counterweights, the crankshaft counterweights between various models of the uh, Lycoming. And I've got, I believe the earliest counterweights, my engine was overhauled about the same time the propeller was uh, changed actually just afterwards. And the overhaul shop did not change to the newer counterweights. Uh, changing to the newer counterweights, which are slightly different uh, was recommended by um, a Comanche shop in California, uh, Mr. Johnston. Yeah. And uh, my uh, uh, engine shop declined to do that. Um, I don't know whether it was miscommunication or whether he felt it wasn't uh, wasn't legal to change to the uh, the other counterweights. Um, so I still have a vibration issue at around 2200, 2100. So I just don't fly in that RPM range. I, I climb out at, at uh, 24 and, and pull it back to uh, 1800 when I get to cruising altitude. I just, I just don't run in that uh, uh, bad place. Another thing that's strange about my engine was uh, my plane had been a demonstrator for a dealer in California in uh, 1958. And it was uh, one of perhaps several where the nose gear down lock bungee cord failed and the nose gear collapsed on landing when the plane had about 50 hours on it, five zero. So it had a replacement crankshaft in it that doesn't look to be the same as the photo in the Lycoming parts book. Again, my overhaul shop um, didn't have any problem with that. Um, that may be part of my vibration issue, I don't know. It, you know, it was a substitute crank and it's slightly different from the photo. Uh, but anyway, I avoid the vibration um, by just being well above that RPM or well below it. And uh, I really enjoy the takeoff performance. I had to change my takeoff protocol. Um, otherwise I'm, I'm rotating too early. I got too much uh, wind going past the tail and it, and it wanted to rotate. So I take off with the uh, trim slightly different, a uh, little more nose down trim and um, climbs out better. Um, but again, no, no difference at all on uh, cruise. Somebody that cruises at a higher RPM might notice a difference because you got more prop drag. But at a low RPM, I'm fewer RPMs is, is fewer feet per minute on the blade tips. And so it's not gonna be a drag issue. Well, that's, it, that's my two bits. All, all very good points, and I'll make a couple of comments. Going from the two-blade Harshall that you had to the three-blade Macaulay, even though you gained a blade, you didn't gain a ton of overall surface area. The Harshall blade that, that was in your previous oh. propeller was an 80, uh, yeah. 8433 blade design, which is a very <laughs> wide cord, square tip blade, a lot of surface area. The blade in that Macaulay tapers very quickly to a fairly uh, narrow tip. So that, that's, that's reducing the amount of surface area, that, especially out in the tip area, is being have to, having to be shoved through the air. So I, I wouldn't expect a huge change uh, top end between those two propellers. Um, a couple of things that I'll note on your vibration issue. Do you know if they tried rotating the propeller 180 degrees on the crankshaft? 
I, I did not. Uh, um, and the reason was that if I did that, when the engine stops, I'd have a blade right down in front of the wheel fork and hooking on my, um, my tow bar would be an issue. I'd be, oh. I'd have to be rotating that propeller after the engine was shut down and still hot. So I figured, okay, I'd rather have the engine stop with a blade vertical <laughs> rather than straight down. Uh, but I, I, I can't imagine that it would matter a whole lot of difference. I've never had a dynamic uh, balancing done. I don't even know where to get one done. I suppose I could ask around. That was going to be my next comment. You, you may take a look at, at getting a dynamic balance done. It may very well solve your problem. Yeah. My, my Hartzell blades, by the way, had been cut down because the propeller was overhauled after after uh, somebody using my plane taxied into a taxiway light and ding both blades. So those blades weren't as large as they had been originally. Uh, they were quite a lot smaller. I noticed a performance loss after that overhaul. Oh yeah. But uh, that was uh, literally many decades ago. That was around 1970. So it, it, it's been a long while. <laughs> yeah, I, my recommendation at this point is to get a dynamic balance done and see if that doesn't doesn't correct the problem. What 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 area of the country are you in? Uh, the San Francisco area. Uh, perfect. Uh, give my very good friend at Sullivan Propeller a call. Brian's. I think I, I believe they're in Hayward, and they were kind enough to give me a um, uh, a free propeller O ring for remounting my propeller when I had to change a fan. They are in Hayward. That is correct. Uh, but yeah, Brian, Brian, that's the outfit. Brian does dynamic balancing as well. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll give him a call. Thank you, sir. Tell, tell him Daryl said hello. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> going, going back to talking about the engine mounts, the rubber, um, am I correct? I'm in the middle right now of, of getting an overhaul done and also a prop overhaul done on my Macaulay three blade. And on the Comanche forum, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the rubber, the engine mounts, and which one is the correct and proper one to you. It, it, is the best source for that, since I have the Macaulay prop, to go to Macaulay and say, here's my engine? Yes. Which? Okay. All right. Yes, because it one, it one time on that Macaulay three-blade conversion, they were actually including new engine pucks with the kit. Yeah. So I, I would definitely uh, talk to McCauley Engineering yeah. about that for sure. And the ones I have now aren't terribly bad, but just because I'm doing all this, I figure it's, you know, it's, it's that, probably that, a good time. I, I agree. To start all fresh. Yeah. I would, I would replace them, but, but you're spot on. I would get in touch with McCauley on that. Okay. All right. Yeah, this is CJ. Just a quick time check. It's 9.23, um, and, and a lot of folks have to leave at 9. I know Daryl's had a long day. Would uh, Just kind of a heads up that we'll try to wrap at uh, 9.30. I want to pass along a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned a view through tachometer. Is that a true tag too or yeah. something else? And where do we get them? Uh, Spruce may sell them. I don't know if they do or not. Okay, super. So the view through the tachometer for everybody's benefit, it's a true tech is T-R-U-T-A-C-H and then two letters like the Roman numeral two. All right. And well, then- What um, you guys can do CJ is uh, buy one as a group and just uh, when people need it, send it to them. You know, that's a great idea. Uh, let's go into my little book. And have a true track loaner program. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, did that, um, we did that in the prop world with uh, some very specific calibration equipment that we needed to uh, calibrate our Hartzell blade rolling machines. WAPA actually uh, purchased three of them, and we just would rotate them around the country to whatever WAPA member was due to calibrate their machine. Saved us a ton of money. Neat. And okay, there it is, aircraft spruce, $194. And John Futter, you're now in charge of uh, making sure we get that program going. 
Um, let's see, B52, ah, yes. Um, a comment from Rob that mass is a big factor in power delivery from a propeller. The lighter the mass, the less, less power is needed just to keep it going around. Um, there was one question from last time. I don't know if you can fit it into a five minute discussion, but it's the ways that props and, and hubs fail and how to know, how we as pilots can know that that is coming, if there is a way. Um, the biggest thing that you guys need to watch for, a couple of things, uh, and I, I, I touched on it earlier, especially with the Hartzell aluminum hub props, don't neglect grease leakage. Um, grease leakage could be actually a function of grease coming through a crack. Uh, that, that's why Hartzell, if you look at any of their literature, they're adamant about um, not allowing any grease leakage with their propellers. Um, some aircraft that have older McCulley propellers on them, those hubs are going to be filled with a red dyed oil that is separate from the pitch control oil. That oil is in there for two things. One is internal lubrication. The other is for early crack detection. So if you happen to have a McCulley propeller and it has uh, what we call a red dyed oil filled hub, if you see any red oil on the cowling, that's cause for termination of, of flight. That needs to be investigated. Um, other things to look for is just any kind of uh, anomalies that you start feeling something funny that you didn't feel before. That, that's cause for the investigation. Short of that, the only thing that you guys can do is, is be more diligent about having your propellers inspected. Um, and uh, CJ and I talked about this last night. An IRAN is okay. Uh, basically an IRAN, all they're gonna do is take your propeller apart. They're gonna wash it, clean up all the, the grease. They're gonna do a visual, and I emphasize visual inspection of the major components and they're gonna if you ask for it, they're going to clean up the blades, repaint them, and put it back together with new seals and new lubricants. The only way to really know uh, exactly what's going on is a full-blown overhaul. The full-blown overhaul is where you're going to get all of the NDT done, all of the, the dye penetrant inspections, the eddy current inspections, the mag particle inspections, as well as a host of dimensional inspections, oh. and of course, a, a, a slew of mandatory replacement parts. Um, my, my personal opinion, uh, I, I tend to agree with, with the way things are done in, in Canada. I, I think a 10 year overhaul is, is, is palatable um, by, the, by GA. I mean, 10 or 12, I, I would be happy with either one of them. But if we're gonna do that, I would wanna see at, at least one mandatory uh, corrosion inspection in between in, in between that interval and that's where you would tear them apart um, clean them up put fresh seals in them fresh lubricants and then run until you reach the the, the hard tbo line that when they got to be done but the only the only true way to really know what's going on with your propeller is to have it overhauled by a competent um, propeller shop unfortunately that that's pretty much the, the best way to do it. Well, Daryl, there is nobody else that I know of that could have done what you just did in these two Comanche Zooms, um, bringing your knowledge and your experience from the field to all of us. I was amazed when I talked with pilots about how little attention we pay to this thing and yet how much stress it's under. Um, Boy, catastrophic things happen if a blade goes off or a hub fails, and we just kind of are like, yeah, it's up there. It always works. And uh, so just want to recognize the expertise and appreciation that we have. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Uh, I've devoted the last uh, 41 years of my life to it and plan on devoting the rest of my working days to, to aviation. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. Um, that's why... I, 
don't mind giving out my phone number if, if people want to call and ask me questions personally. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, hopefully, I can direct them in the in the right direction and get the proper service done that they need done. Um, if we make a few uh, Hartzell propeller sales along the way, that's great. A few electro air ignition sales along the way, that's great. Um, but uh, the overall function is making sure that we've got a safe flying community. Everybody's uh, happy and uh, flying along. I think with that, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. This will be available probably mid-morning tomorrow for anybody who wants to go back and take a look at it. The, uh, the one for last week is also up there, so you can look at the whole nine yards if you want to. And uh, again, I'm going to thank Daryl for a, a terrific job. This is Pete. I'm going to shut off the recording to this point. Good night, everybody.